Hello again. Let's talk about string interning and the flyweight pattern. String interning is when, instead of representing a string as, say, an array of characters, we represent a string as a pointer to an array of characters that's stored in a data structure. Anytime we create a new string, we first check if that string is in the data structure already. If it isn't, we put it there and keep its address. If it is, we just maintain a pointer to that same string. Yes, it's another layer of indirection between us and our precious string. There's a famous saying by David Wheeler, all problems in computer science can be solved by another level of indirection. And a famous corollary by Kevlin Henney, except for the problem of too many layers of indirection. So this adds a lot of complexity to your string handling. It might not be worth it, but let's talk about what you get in return. Fast comparison, immutability, memory efficiency, fast copy, and internationalization. String comparison. You know how it works. You walk through each string and check if the first item is the same, then the second item, then the third, and so on and so forth until you find a pair that doesn't match, or you reach the end of both strings. There are subtleties to it. If you know the string length of both strings, and they're different, they can't possibly be the same string. However, we know that, using string interning, if we have two strings that are the same, they will both be represented by the same pointer. String comparison becomes as easy as just testing the equality of two integers, a lightning-fast operation. In systems where string comparisons form the bulk of the work and the strings are very uniform, for example compilers or interpreters, this savings is significant. I should definitely at some point do a longer episode about mutability. A variable that is immutable can never be changed, whereas a variable that is mutable can be changed, and the difference between these two types of variable have many wide-ranging effects on systems that you design. Variables that are teenage mutable might live in sewers, eat pizza, and fight ninjas. A necessary property of string interning is that strings that we point to must never change. If A and B both point to butts and B wants a different string, to append lol for example, a new entry must be created. We'll talk about the downside of this shortly, but the upside of immutability is that the object you're working with is very easy to reason about, especially in a multi-threaded environment. Nasty race conditions are a lot harder to encounter with objects that cannot be changed. As you might imagine, if you have a small number of strings that are used again and again, this can buy you a large memory savings, as each of these strings is stored only once. As well, the copy operation is as simple as creating a new pointer to the string in question. Many modern languages perform string interning quietly behind the scenes for you. Python, for example, does this with any strings that aren't very long, rendering them very similar to symbols from Ruby, Lisp, or Scheme, which are also interned. Java and .NET languages in turn all literal strings as a compilation step. Strings read from files or the user during runtime would need to be interned manually. You get no such magic, however, from C or C++, lower level languages where you are expected to manage such performance improvements yourself. In the Unreal Engine, for example, you'll find fname, which is a fast, case-insensitive interned string used for identification of in-game objects. In the business world, interning is an ethically questionable way of getting gullible students to perform work for you for free. This, of course, favors people who are able to afford to perform free work and helps solidify the dominance of rich white dudes in the workforce. Now, the thing about automatic string interning is that it doesn't allow you to get your grubby fingers on the implementation, but a more deliberate layer of indirection can buy you valuable features. In a case that is growing increasingly common in modern development, you may find yourself with a set of strings, only one of which should be shown to the user based on the context of their language settings. We might, for example, want to display on the screen, hello. Well, instead of printing hello, we instead have a symbol or short intern string corresponding with this message, perhaps hello or greeting. Then we reference a lookup table containing a mapping between this key, the current language setting, and the string that we actually want to display to the user. Bonjour! Upside down exclamation mark, hola, saluton, incomprehensible squiggly. There's probably another lesson in here about using Unicode, but we'll leave that for another time. Now let's talk about what string interning costs you. Okay, so you're adding all this infrastructure to make your string comparisons more efficient, but all of this infrastructure comes at the price of, well, infrastructure. If you're building it yourself, you have to build and maintain a pile of extra code. If you're depending on an automatic implementation built into your system, you're going to either need to learn about what the magic is doing for you, or occasionally run into a bug that is totally senseless. Here, let's look at some Python. Hello is hello. Well, obviously it's true. These are the same strings. Hell plus O is hello. Okay, well that's, that's true too. It, it seems like it should be true. 
Now for the strangeness. If we assign S1 to be equal to hell and S2 to be equal to hello, then S1 plus O is S2. That should be true, right? Well, actually, it's false. Now, if we were to use the equality operator, equals equals, Python would properly report that these strings are the same. But we're using in, which tests for identity. And because the result of S1 plus O is not interned, these strings have a different identity. On top of that, Python's interning behavior is different based on which implementation you're using. This is C Python, so it acts this way, but other implementations of Python can act any way they so choose. And last but not least, if you have an environment where every string is unique, all of this infrastructure buys you nothing at all. Python's automatic string interning, for example, just stops happening after somewhere between 4 and 8 characters, after which the interpreter just assumes that the chance that two strings will be the same is not worth the expense of interning those strings. Now, as you've watched this presentation, you might be thinking, hey, if this works for strings, shouldn't it work for any other heavyweight object that I have a lot of immutable copies of? Well, yeah. This is known as the flyweight design pattern. The classical example of this in the Gang of Four's design patterns book has to do with character glyphs in word processing. Each character is an object containing a ton of data about how exactly it should be rendered. We don't need a copy of this data for each letter we have on the page. Each character can reference a shared immutable object that contains all of that data only once in memory. Of course, with more complicated objects, the language is less likely to provide this functionality for you automatically. If you want an intelligent implementation, you're going to have to do some research. Okay, that's the presentation. Thanks for watching.